Hello, this is Joel Moses with the Photographic Historical Society of New England. I want to welcome everyone who is connected and hear Dr. Hamber give his presentation about the rise of photographic illustrations in the 1800s. Before we get to that, I just want to mention that FISNI is in the midst of our election season, which happens every other year. If you have not already voted for the candidates on the slate, or maybe you have another suggestion, please do so. Um, if you are not already a member, please contact us for a ballot and we will send one out to you expeditiously. I look forward to hearing from you and now look forward to hearing Dana take over. Thank you and enjoy the program. Thank you, Joel. Uh, I'm Dana G. I'm the program coordinator for FISNI. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a few uh, notes. Could everyone please remain on mute during the presentation? What we're going to do is take Q&A at the end and any questions you have as we go along, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a chat window and just enter your questions in chat addressed to everyone, which should be the default so that we can all see them. And at the end of the presentation, I will uh, relay them to Dr. Hamber. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, also, uh, at the end, we'll discuss the show and tell party meeting. We're going to have a virtual gathering uh, for December's meeting on the 5th, following the elections. So look for an email on how to sign up for that and more news on that later. Okay. Our presenter today is uh, Dr. Anthony Hamber, and um, he's an independent photographic historian focused on the period from 1839 to 1880, um, specializing, spe specializing in the photographic reproduction of art and architecture and the rise of photographically illustrated publications. He's published and lectured extensively on these themes. Um, he is uh, researching the evolution of photographic and photomechanical printing processes, writing an accompanying book with his co-author, Stephen Joseph. And he's the author of uh, numerous books, catalogs, and papers. His most recent book is a study of the origins of photography in his home city of Salisbury, England. Um, other recent activity includes a role as a photographic historian for an episode of the BBC program, Fake of Fortune. He was a member of the advisory board for the Bodleian Library's online catalog resume of William Henry Fox Talbot. And uh, let's welcome Dr. Hamber. Please take it away, Anthony. Thank you. Can you uh, all see a full screen of my presentation? Good. Um, well, thank you very much, Joel and, and Dana, for the uh, introduction. Um, what, what I want to do is to really underline that the main takeaway from this presentation is that there were many photographic print processes invented and employed to form published illustrations with text in the period 1839 to 1880. The search for a photomechanical process began in 1839, the year of the announcement of photography. There were also many other reprographic processes with which photographic processes competed. In 1859, Stannard cited some 156 processes uh, in his art exemplar. Now, I'll not go into detail on the technical and chemical uh, elements uh, of the photographic processes that I'm going to illustrate. I'd recommend that you look at YouTube, a rich resource, particularly the video productions of the George Eastman Museum, the Getty Museum, and the Victoria and Albert Museum here in London. But I think the fundamental is that I encourage you to handle physically as much original material as you can. And you will have to understand that there are limitations on what you can physically see on the screen. So 
Here are the two fathers of photography who came from very different backgrounds. Daguerre was a showman and an entrepreneur, and the French government made a deal with Daguerre, acquiring in August 1839 the rights to the process that he had invented in exchange for lifetime pensions for both Daguerre and the son of uh, Nisiphorn Yeps, who'd done a lot of original research and who Daguerre worked with. Now Talbot was a polymath member of the landed gentry who pursued firstly a photographic process and then a photomechanical process. So Daguerre built on Nisiphor Niepce's process. So in the top right hand corner is the portrait of Joseph Nisiphor Niepce. And then on the left hand side is one of his original plates. Uh, and it is a copper plate uh, and it photochemically has been coated and then contact printed. And the print from that plate can be seen in the middle there. Now by late 1839, the universal impact of the daguerreotype was captured in this lithograph, which was issued in December uh, 1839 uh, in La Caricature. The two details suggest the fate of the engravers and also the production of paper prints from daguerreotypes. So the detail on the left shows that the, uh, the way of uh, engravers, they're all hanging from uh, yard arms. And on the right hand side, there's reference to daguerreotypes on paper and the system of Dr. Donnet. So remember Donnet, so he's going to come back. So this was a pretty cataclysmic event, the invention of the and, uh, uh, announcements of daguerreotype because people were aware of its fundamental impact on reproduction. The form and function of the photographic, permanent photographic, photomechanical and hybrid processes is a very specialist consideration. Each have technical, aesthetic and commercial aspects. In addition, different languages gave different names to the same process. For instance, color type is referred to as Lichtdruck in German and Phototypie in French. Note I've also highlighted in red autotype and crystallotype. Autotype was a company trade name, not a process, and several photographic processes were used under this trade name. Crystallotype is more complicated and I'll come back to that later. So if we move to the daguerreotype, to make a daguerreotype required a substantial amount of equipment as illustrated here, and a lot of craft skills, knowledge of chemistry, and perseverance. But almost immediately, the potential to be able to take uh, the daguerreotype image on a silvered copper plate and en engrave it in order to be able to print from it uh, took place. So I mentioned uh, Donnet previously, and here we have in 1839 to 1840, a daguerreotype plate of a reduced uh, copy of the Venus de Milo, which is in the Louvre. And you can see um, an attempt here to engrave it. Probably the first major breakthrough and international uh, dissemination of knowledge of printing from daguerreotype plates took, in took place in Vienna in 1840. So Professor Josef Beres um, was a anatomist. He was not uh, a printer or an engraver. And this is an important uh, consideration of these early photographic photomechanical processes. There were not printers or reprographic houses driving the innovation. And so here we can see the two illustrations um, on the center and the right hand side are from a Beres publication there, the Phototyp nach der Erfindung des Professor Beres in Wien. So this is what in essence is a heliogravure process. It's ink printed onto paper. And there were five illustrations in this publication. Here we have uh, an example of another plate uh, by Beres. 
uh, and a version of the print from it. You can see down here the letterpress at the bottom of the right hand printed image. And I think it's very important to understand that you can often identify the print process by the credits at the bottom of printed images and photographically illustrated publications. Now, the commercial potential of the daguerreotype was recognized quite quickly, as I said. But here we have a, a view from the Art Union, uh, an in, in influential uh, British uh, serial publication. And the point here is that an entirely photomechanical process would remove the need for an engraver altogether. And of course, this put uh, shockwaves through uh, the reefer graphics and printing industry. Here we've got a, an example from 1841, a photogravure process by uh, Fizeau, who was a very well-known uh, French physicist. Um, and the point here is that, it, again, it's an ink on, on paper print, but it's lacking an, an entirely smooth grayscale. It's a bit contrasty, as you would say, but to be quite frank, it's not bad. Now, one of the uh, um, aspects um, of reproducing daguerreotypes was to copy them uh, by traditional processes. And here we've got a, an aqua tint, and sorry, the name of the engraving has been obscured by the, by the print itself. Uh, but this is uh, from a, a, an, uh, a title of a publication called Vue d'Italie d'après la daguerreotype, um, and it was issued in, in parts, as many of them were, which you probably can't see, but down in the left-hand corner uh, is, the, is the giveaway where it does say that it's been taken from a daguerreotype. The point here is that uh, the figures have been inserted um, and uh, the rest of it, basically the bit that didn't move and was recorded in uh, the daguerreotype uh, has been transcribed reasonably uh, well. Uh, and similarly, the clouds have been inserted in the aquatint. Um, the Excursion de Guerrienne was an important uh, publication published between 1840 and 1842 in its part works. And again, followed the previous um, slide I've showed of aquatints after daguerreotypes. But it did also include two um, illustrations uh, of a photo engraving. And here's one of them on the left. It's uh, the Apostles at the Tomb of the Virgin, and it's the north side of the east end of Notre Dame in Paris. And Fizeau uh, photographed a number of different uh, parts of the building uh, and produced photo engravings from them. These didn't actually appear in Excursion de Guerrienne. Now, John William Draper was one of the earliest photographers in America. He invented around 1843 a process he named Tithonotype to make electrotype copies of daguerreotypes. He extended Fizeau's process to make direct copies while it had some success in New York, being used by the lithographer George Endicott. The process was not widely adopted. And Draper does not appear to have experimented with etching or engraving daguerreotype originals. But again, it shows that uh, particularly in the 1840s and the first half, there was a lot of experimentation going on around uh, in industrialized countries. And we're only beginning to understand uh, the scale and scope uh, today. Now, from the 1840s to the 1860s, making engraved or lithographed copies uh, of uh, photographic originals was common. Here we have the Gallery of Illustrious Americans, published in 1850 with lithographs by Davignon after daguerreotypes by Matthew Brady. Both the lithographs, uh, of which there were 24, and the original daguerreotypes from which they were made, or copied rather, uh, such as the image in the middle, uh, were exhibited uh, at the side by side at the 1851 Great Exhibition in London. And you can notice here that the daguerreotype original in the middle uh, has been laterally reversed uh, in the print, which is on the right hand side, and that's due to the copying process. 
And here is an 1853 example of an engraved uh, frontispiece after a daguerreotype by Whipple, uh, the occasion of the death of uh, the Honourable Daniel Webster. And again, the caption explains uh, some of the background. Now, one te technique to reproduce photographs as wood engravings was to coat the wood block with a photochemical emulsion, print the photograph onto this layer on the wood block, and then engrave through the photographic print to produce a woodcut ready for printing. So you washed off the remainder of the photographic image and you had a woodcut block ready for printing. And this is an example from 1855, a portrait of the photographer Charles Harrison after a photograph by John Brinkerhoff. So if we now look at um, some of the earliest photographic drawings, um, processes, uh, other than the daguerreotype, the first that Talbot invented was the photograph, photogenic drawing. So this was really just a direct contact print um, process. Here we got an example of a fern. But also um, you could produce photographic drawing negatives. And this is St. Syriac's church in Laycock, uh, taken by Fox Talbot. And a positive print could be made by contact printing with another sheet of photosensitized photogenic drawing paper, i.e. a negative of, the neg of a negative equals a positive. And there were some uh, examples here of attempts to produce facsimiles of photogenic drawings. And I think this must have been very confusing for contemporaries because uh, this illustration um, is not a photogenic drawing. It is a copy, uh, a woodcut made after one. Here's a, another interesting uh, photogenic drawing from uh, Matthew Carey Lee. It's in the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. You can see 1841 uh, attempts again being made uh, in the States. If we go back to uh, the UK, the magazine of science, we've got more facsimiles of photogenic drawings on the uh, left hand side. On the right hand side, uh, only uh, um, a few weeks later, that's an issue of May the 4th, uh, the left is uh, April the 27th. We've got here the, the bottom image, a facsimile of the photogenic drawing, and above a view of Erith Church in Kent. And this is really showing the, um, the principle of the positive and negative view, but rather inadvertently. So the second process that uh, Talbot invented uh, was the color type, also known as the Talbot type. And this was based on being able to chemically develop out uh, a latent image in the negative and then print from it. Now, printing uh, photo photographic prints um, throughout the period was done um, using daylight uh, out in the open area uh, and simply contact printing. So this is a view of in 1846, uh, part of a two part panorama of the uh, Reading establishment that Talbot uh, helped set up for his manservant Henneman to run. And you can see the boy there who's uh, uh, looking at the frames. So what he has to do is open up the frame, uh, peel back the piece of paper uh, to see whether it's actually got a print forming on it. Uh, and if it hadn't been developed um, or printed uh, dark enough just to put it back again and give it a few more minutes. It then had to be taken away and fixed. Now, here we've got uh, an 1862 view of one of the top uh, photographers uh, of in London at the period, Camille Sylvie, a Frenchman. And what I wanted to point out here is they're all men there. The, the, the printers are men. Uh, in 1870, just to give you an indication of scale, uh, Adolf Braun of Dornach in Alsace in France, he uh, set up a printing works and in 1870 it was reported that he had a hundred men and boys employed as photographic printers. However, by the 1880s photographic printing had become the domain of women 
this is the view of uh, George Washington Wilson's printing works uh, in, uh, in Scotland. And you'll notice that every single printer now is a woman. And moving on another few years to 1891, you've got the, the uh, printing of Kodak negatives uh, in building two in Harrow in North London. And again, they're all women. And the other interesting factor is that the glass in there may well have been special high quality glass to reduce the green cast that would uh, appear in, uh, in ordinary off the shelf um, glaziers. Uh, and that green cast would have affected printing. So the actual photographic print was uh, initially the salted paper process. So this is a photochemical image in the fiber, fiber structure of the painter, of the paper. And the first uh, and best known uh, example, large scale, was the Pencil of Nature, which was issued in parts from 1844. Um, this was something of a vanity publication since Fox Talbot actually paid for some of the production costs. Here we've got plate one, which was published in June 1844. And you can see here that the plate uh, um, has been mounted uh, onto a se separate piece of uh, card, which is a thicker stock than the, the uh, text page. And it's within a line border, but it's got no caption. Another um, attempt uh, Fox Talbot, who believed that every man should become a publisher, an illustrated publisher using his photographic process, uh, was the Art Union issue for June 1846. Now what happened here was that uh, Talbot and Henneman, his manservant, had to print as many prints as they could. I think in total around 6,000 were sent to the publisher Samuel Carter Hall, um, and uh, this is a a small print that the, um, the purchaser of that particular month's part work would have received. Here we've got a much bigger print, uh, the Chateau at Chambord. And the point I want to make here is that that printed caption at the bottom has been cut out of a paper envelope. So what you got was a paper wrapper with your June text uh, for the art union in it plus a brown paper envelope with a photograph on the mounted card and the type, uh, printed label uh, for that particular image. And this particular owner has cut out uh, the uh, label and stuck it underneath the image. However, that image is not what it looked like and I've sort of digitally enhanced it, uh, not particularly effectively, but it would have been much darker and richer than the, uh, the state that it's in now. Now, I mentioned the cristallotype was the name of the process uh, earlier on. I mean, it's, it was patented in 1850 by Whipple of Boston, and it consisted of making salted paper prints from albumin on glass negatives. However, the contemporary advertisement seen in the top right corner of this slide is extremely confusing, referring to daguerreotypes taken on paper. And the view on the left is of the Hancock House on Beacon Hill in Boston and formed the frontispiece of Homes of American Statesmen, published by Putnam in New York in 1854. You can see also here this um, down in the bottom right hand corner is a blind stamp. And so some photographic publications would have a blind stamp normally at the center below the below the pasted on image. Here's a, a view of the um, uh, of a cristallotype by uh, James Wallace Back, a uh, view of the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Here's a view of Grey Fox uh, taken by Julian Vanison. Again, a salted paper print in the pea body. So remember that these images are formed actually in the fiber of the paper, and therefore they they are they appear quite matte flat as it were. Here we have a, another view. Again, this doesn't really sh um, show clearly um, the uh, 
the image being in the, in the paper base, uh, a youth. Uh, and the salted paper print remained popular up until the 1860s. And this is uh, from a glass plate negative. And here's a, a portrait of Abraham Lincoln, uh, again, a salted paper print uh, taken and printed in 1859 in Chicago. So the, the most uh, um, notable use of the salted paper print was in the 1852 photographically illustrated uh, volumes of the reports by the juries of the 1851 Great Exhibition. So 140 copies uh, in four volumes were um, uh, created uh, of reports by the juries to be presented to the good and the great, the commissioners and also the heads of state of each of the contributing uh, countries. Now in order to do this, 20,000 salted paper photographs needed to be printed. And Robert Bingham, an Englishman based in Versailles on the outskirts of Paris, printed most of them from uh, glass negatives, an extraordinary early example of mass printing of photographs. And on the right is the view of Hiram Power's Greek slave, one of the stars of the exhibition. Now, I'm using this detail here to show you that um, these uh, paper prints had to be hand trimmed and then hand mounted uh, onto uh, a thicker piece of, uh, of card stock. And here you can see at the bottom the dotted line that the mounter would have to uh, place and register uh, the print. And clearly here this has not gone, gone well. I thought I'd have a, a little discussion about colour. So one of the ways, there wasn't colour photography uh, as we know it until um, really uh, on the commercial basis until the autochrome at the beginning of the 20th century. So what tended to happen was that uh, photographs were painted. Uh, obviously they cost a lot more. And here we have uh, Roger Fenton uh, photograph, the Council of War at Lord Raglan's headquarters. Uh, and this is part of the Crimean War series. It's a salted paper print from 1855. And on the right hand side, uh, there's a coloured version of it. So literally that's watercolours applied directly onto uh, the photographic print. Here's a, uh, a rather excessively painted, overpainted uh, portrait of Hole in the Day, um, a, a hand coloured uh, print. And, you know, bluntly, it's, it's completely masked out uh, the photographic original. As has this one, uh, a Union soldier uh, from about 1865. So one of the problems uh, that early photography faced, and in fact, what we know today as black and white photography uh, didn't appear uh, until the early part of the 20th century, and that's panchromatic film. And before that, the photographic chemicals were not sensitive to the entire visible spectrum or part of the visible part of the spectrum. So we've got here, uh, what I think is quite a good example of the difference between orthochromatic film, which was introduced in 1873, and notice the dark um, dress in the left-hand image. And below you can see the actual part of the spectrum that's being recorded and the panchromatic film. And in fact, uh, I've got, a, it's unfortunate that we haven't got a, a pre-orthochromatic um, film example on the left-hand side. Uh, because that would show even more limited uh, spectral sensitivity. So what did that actually mean in, in practice? Well, we've got here a modern photograph of Roger van der Weyden's deposition in the Prado in Madrid. What I'd like you to do is look at the blue dress of the Virgin and also to the very decorative um, robe, uh, the figure to the right of Christ's body, um, the gold and brown uh, trimmings. So that's what it looks like. This is a reproduction of it by Juan Laurent, uh, a French uh, photographer who, who uh, 
was based in Madrid for his working life. Now, first of all, can you see, I'm sorry, this is only a reproduction out of a book, but the blue cloak of the Virgin, which was an iconographic standard, has actually been painted in. Now, what I mean by that is that because the uh, photographic emulsion was so sensitive to blue, it made the whole of her cloak black on the negative, which would have printed white in the print. So what Laurent did was he got out chemicals and he brushed out the black uh, negative in order to produce that black part of the negative in order to thin it out to allow light through to give it a dark tone. And similarly, if you look at the other figure in there, you can see how much has been lost on the, the gold and brown cloak. So one thing that's very important to understand is that manual retouching was a major industry uh, and continued as such right up until the advent of digital imaging systems. And obviously now Adobe Photoshop is almost ubiqu ubiquitous. But there are, there are uh, you know, images of large photographic houses with gangs of retouchers retouching negatives. Now the album process. So what we've moved away from here is a photochemical image in the, the fiber of the paper to a, uh, a being suspended in an album and coating on top of the paper. And so here we've got uh, um, a 1864 example, uh, privately printed um, a memoir of uh, Royal Williams in Maine. The thing that um, I wanted to try and show you, and these are two images that are montaged together, and that is that if you look at the bottom of the title page, you can see that the mount for the photograph doesn't actually match the format of the title page. And so what's happening here is that um, the piece of thicker stock is being used to mount the, the album and print, and then it's bound into a copy uh, of this publication. But you could find copies that didn't have the photographic illustration and copies that did. So uh, always re remember that, that there are sometimes copies of uh, issues of a title that don't have the photographic illustration and some that do and they were priced accordingly. So here we've got an album in print uh, by James, uh, William James Stillman from his photographic studies series uh, 1859 and that colour in there is because he probably uh, toned uh, his album in print to fix it. Here we've got a, a print from uh, the Central Park album by Victor Provost in, in New York from 1862. Now this is a, an interesting example by uh, John Eccleston, the Jerusalem Photographic Album, uh, which was published in 1865. So this is an attempt to uh, put a photographic image on a page of text. So what's happened here is that the text is, is printed uh, within its frame at the bottom, a gold line frame is printed blank and the photograph is trimmed and put into, uh, into the, uh, the area, the window. Now this is a, a complicated example, uh, it's a British example by uh, uh, Leona de Caldesi, published by uh, his publishing partners P&D Colnaghi and 1864. So it's a series of, of portraits um, and the important thing to hear is that the first stage was that each of the album and prints needed to be printed to scale. They then had to be accurately trimmed and then accurately mounted onto the plate, the page, uh, and this uh, and that has a, and you just faint at the bottom, a pre-printed caption. Now some form of template mask must have been used in order to uh, enable the um, accurate uh, placing of those fact photographic images uh, on the plate. What we've got here, although this is a, um, these are two cabinet cards, uh, is an example of Matthew Brady, uh, the President Hayes and his cabinet, and also the Secretary of State and the Chiefs of Bureaus. So what's happened here is that uh, individual album and prints have been pasted onto a board 
uh, which has got some letterpress uh, and line frames. That's been photographed and an album and print has been made of that and then cut and pasted, trimmed and pasted onto the card. So this particular image, the individual portraits aren't individually pasted on. That's, that was done prior to, to this. Now, one of the uh, um, issues with the camera exposures and getting the right amount of illumination. So here we've got a uh, photograph by Edward, Edward Baldus of the cloister of Saint Trophime in Arles in France. This is in fact a, a sorted paper print. But what I want to show you is that it's actually made up from a, a number of prints. Uh, and we've got here uh, um, the lines showing you how many uh, prints had to be made from how many negatives to create uh, the full image. And this was a very skilled task to get all the uh, balances of the tones correct uh, to look uh, fine when they were uh, they were combined together. Another example uh, I wanted to point out, this is the album of the Trab and Sport. So this is trotting. Now, we need to unpick this photograph. The horse is artwork. Uh, since capturing such movement was still in experimental stage through the work of Mybridge. The jockey was probably sitting on the sulky or spider as it's called in a studio. And now the background uh, is a in the grandstand and the figures there uh, is possibly a painting. So this is another example of combination printing. So photographic print uh, formats. So here we've got um, uh, the two most popular formats, the stereoscopic view on the left and a carte de visite on the right. And both were used to illustrate uh, text publications. And here we can have a, a staged view of the interior of the shop of uh, Appleton on Broadway in New York, showing the popularity of the stereoscopic views. Literally millions of them were being, being sold from the 1860s on. And here we've got uh, a view of uh, the production process uh, in the works of uh, Alex Godin in Paris in the 1860s. So each one of those, um, uh, this is a highly staged view, but each one of um, the, the characters there is working on a particular element. You can see behind, uh, hanging from the ceiling, drying, uh, are stereo uh, views, but in strips of four, and they then had to be cut uh, and uh, maybe had uh, additional labels pasted onto them. So it was very labor intensive. So the carte de visite was uh, enabled to a degree uh, by uh, the use of um, uh, the carte de visite uh, camera, which allowed um, eight images to be taken on one sheet of film by moving, uh, moving the, uh, uh, the lens around. Uh, and sometimes this was uh, used um, so that different publications actually were given uh, different illustrations from different uh, photographs from these uh, strips of eight. So if we move to publishers, specialist publishers. So Samson Lowe uh, was a very important uh, bookseller and publisher in uh, Great Britain. He was the publisher of the influential trade journal, The Publisher's Circular which is sort of one of my staples to uh, identify photographic illustrated publications. And here is one of his works. Um, we have uh, from Samson Lowe and his son and master, and there were a number of partners there. So this uh, view of uh, um, Amelroy Castle in Belgium. Um, and these are Woodbury type prints, I'll come on to those. Another um, important one was um, Alfred, William Alfred Bennett, when he was an innovatory publisher of uh, photographically illustrated publications. And in a decade, 
Uh, he didn't uh, actually produce many over, uh, sorry, he produced 50 in a period of only a decade, but then he stopped and went on to uh, other um, areas, particularly as a botanist. And here's an example of his innovation. Uh, we've got uh, abbeys and castles uh, of England. Uh, and you can see here on the cover, uh, which is highly embossed, there's a pasted on album and print uh, circular in the middle. And here's a page which shows you um, his, uh, his, his method of um, pasting uh, album prints into pages, uh, gaps in pages of printed text. Now the photographic press is another rich source of information on photographic uh, print processes. Edward Wilson, a photographer and writer, published the influential Philadelphia Photographer. One hallmark of this journal was that uh, it, different processes um, were used to illustrate. In this example, uh, it's a portrait of Hermann Vogel, the great German photochemist, with, from your old friend H. Vogel at the bottom. James Osgood was an innovatory publisher who adopted the heliotype process, which was a collotype process during the 1870s. He published more than 80 books. Most of them were of graphic art, specifically engravings. So photolithography was a natural progression since lithography was well uh, introduced. These two images are alleged to be photolithographs and they date from 1842. But little is known about uh, Zerka and uh, what he uh, how he, what he was actually doing. Le Mercier was a uh, a printer publisher uh, who was one of the few who was interested in innovatory processes. And here we've got two two images of photolithographs, both from around 1852. Uh, the real father of uh, photolithography and collotype printing which is ink on paper, uh, was uh, Alphonse Louis Poitvin. Here's one of his earliest uh, works um, from Paris in 1856, Les Halles in Paris. And again, look at the uh, uh, underneath the image, particularly about sort of five o'clock on there, it does say uh, that it's a photolithograph. This is a, another interesting example uh, photolithograph by Dujon or Jardin and Le Mercier. So it doesn't look like a, a photolithograph. And that's because it, the, uh, the original uh, photolithograph has been overprinted with colour to produce this rather stunning image. So here's an American example, Villas on the Hudson, a collection of photolithographs of 31 country residences from 1860. This is an interesting publication by the American Photolithographic Company uh, from 1868. I think it's the only issue of this uh, serial called the Magpie, which basically took uh, European uh, um, humorous publications like Punch magazine uh, and produced a compendium of them. And photolithography was very popular uh, for um, reproducing uh, diagrams uh, for machines uh, and other other uh, architectural drawings in particular. So we go on to photogravelnography. So this was um, Paul Pretsch who in, had worked in the Staatsdruckerei in Vienna which was a hotbed of uh, innovation in photo, photo mechanical processes. He invented a process um, and patented it uh, and these are some of the samples from him. He faced two challenges. One, they were very heavily manually um, retouched and also Fox Talbot took legal action against him, uh, against Pretch, uh, saying that he'd infringed his 1852 patent and uh, the, the company closed in 1858. So here we've got photoglyphic engraving, which is Fox Talbot's um, uh, heliogravure process. And these were issued um, as, as free samples uh, in uh, the periodic, uh, sorry, the photographic press uh, at the time. Again, uh, the grayscale is a bit contrasty. But uh, his photographic engraving um, was uh, a very high quality. And you can see here 
uh, how he, uh, an example uh, from 1878 in a history and handbook of photography by Tissandier. So photozincography, just wanted to show you quickly these. So here, rather than a lithographic stone, uh, it's on a zinc plate. It was used to reproduce the Doomsday Book, uh, in, uh, which is on the left, uh, the important 11th century uh, national manuscript, and also other manuscripts. Uh, this is, these were taking place in the Ordnance Survey in Southampton in the 1860s. They then moved on to National Manuscripts of Ireland. Uh, these are uh, important because uh, the manuscripts which they came from were all destroyed uh, in a fire uh, in uh, 1922 in the Dublin Record Office. But the work would cost 15 times uh, the ordinary cost of reproducing um, uh, manuscripts. Uh, uh, this was because uh, each colour had to be applied by hand uh, um, onto the, uh, photo, uh, the photolithographic original. These were two plates, uh, two, sorry, illustrations from this Netley Abbey volume, uh, which is probably the most ambitious um, of the, uh, um, of James, Henry James, the director of the Ordnance Survey, but there are very few copies. There's only two copies that I've been able to locate. The carbon process. The carbon process was a permanent process, but it was on carbon tissue. Uh, and the carbon tissue could be uh, uh, made uh, in lots of different colors. And you can see samples here uh, from uh, the albums, the great master uh, drawings uh, of the kind of colors that were possible. And these were printed uh, by Adolf Brown uh, in uh, Alsace, um, but they also were licensed to the Autotype Company who called them autotype, but in fact they're carbon prints. These are from the 1870s. Here's a carbon print from a book Rip Van Winkle from 1871. The story of the Jubilee Singers, again a carbon print, although this came out in multiple um, uh, editions and the Woodbury type process, which I'll come on to, was also used to illustrate. So the Woodbury type process so it was produced by um, a hydraulic press. So basically a, an image was formed by pressing an exposed dichromate gelatin into a piece of lead, which is comparatively soft. Uh, and then the, the mold was filled with ink and under enormous pressure, uh, a sheet of paper was pressed onto it. And what you get is incredibly fine detail and very rich tones. Here's a an illustration from the uh, Baldwin Locomotive Works, its catalogue from 1871-72. Here are some other examples from 1873. This is a commemoration of St Andrew's Church in Philadelphia. And you can see here uh, underneath the images, it mentions both that it's a Woodbury type and also the printer. Woodbury type was very popular for reproducing um, portraits of, uh, of well-known celebrities. So here we've got Charles Darwin from the Men of Mark series, which went from the 1870s up to the 1880s. Another very famous one was the Gallery Contemporaine. This is uh, Alexander Dumas. Um, they, these are stunning, absolutely stunning. They're large and, uh, and, and very, very high quality. So we go to collar type, which was a uh, important, this was uh, invented by, uh, or master, mastered really by Joseph Albert Munich. And here's a view of his, uh, his collar type studio, uh, his printing, printing rooms, uh, which was issued in the photographic news in the UK in 1870. So we've got some Albert types here of, um, uh, they were collar types, but they were branded in, uh, the states as Albert types. Um, what interests me is that um, here we've got uh, William Henry Jackson photographs uh, and they're credited to uh, Beerstedt as Albert types, but the expedition was uh, actually um, financed by William Blackmore of Salisbury, who I've uh, written about. So you have the Heliotype printing company. Again, uh, it's a, a collar type process. 
you know, famous publications such as the illustrations of China and its people. Again, with collar types. This is four volumes in 1873. We've got the Harvard book here, uh, a series of, of views of um, Harvard from 1875. And again, you can find um, uh, the collar type being used for architectural drawings. So this is the American architect and building news from 1877. But there are stunning uh, collar types. Rommler uh, and Jonas of uh, Dresden were perhaps the masters of the collar type in Germany. And the original of this is uh, of this particular plate is uh, extraordinary in quality. So quickly on to some colour images. So this is the um, photochromy process of Leon Vidal of Paris. Basically it's a Woodbury type with overprintings of colour and up to 14 colours might be applied. So a series were produced of the Musée National du Louvre and the Galerie d'Apollon. Um, interestingly the uh, John Ruskin, the great art critic, wrote that every public institution uh, should possess several copies of this publication and he stated it contains representations which no mechanical art can be conceived ever likely to excel. Finally Heliogravure, this is a, an 1869 example uh, from a publication called Wooden Ships. The Heliogravure process uh, also um, reproduced um, facsimiles of uh, old master drawings and Armand Durand uh, produced such high quality ones that uh, there are some collections that still believe they've got the original Albert Durer and they haven't, they've just got a, a copy uh, by a Helia Gravure from Armand Durand. And again, very high quality Palais de Louvre from uh, a series 1869 to 1875. By Baldus. Another example uh, from the uh, Heliotype Printing Company in Boston of Harvard and its surroundings, copiously illustrated. And finally, we come to the half tone process. And the half tone process is based on a screen, uh, just dots of various sizes. And uh, Talbot was experimenting with these in the early. Um, early 1850s um, using the pieces of gauze. But this man is very interesting. I, I, don't, I need to learn a lot more about him. So Stephen Henry Horgan and this is a newspaper, a daily graphic from 1873 using a half tone image. And you know I'm sorry I, I didn't, that's a, a copy of a copy there but bluntly it looks pretty good to me as an illustration uh, in an 1873 uh, newspaper. He in fact was um, using a patented process uh, by uh, Lego and Deborah of uh, Canada uh, from 1869 um, and it was patented in the United States in 1871 but only four issues of the Daily Graphic included such illustrations. And finally um, we've got Carl Klisch um, who, uh, whose photograph, uh, heliogravure process um, was really uh, something. Um, this is an illustration, a sample uh, uh, that appeared in the Photographische Correspondence in 1880. Um, and really that was the, the peak of the quality uh, capabilities of photomechanical printing. And it's also a, uh, a point where I, I my, my sort of research stops because bluntly it gets out of control after that just trying to keep, uh, keep abreast of all the publications. So thank you very much that was a bit of a, a rush through but um, I hope you learned something from that and I'd be very happy to take questions. Thank you uh, Anthony that was amazing. I, um, I know we have questions lined up but if everyone would like to unmute and give Anthony a round of applause. We'll start the questions afterwards. Thanks, Pat. 
All right, let me let me get to my chat. All right. Uh, let's see. We're going to start with um, Marty had a question uh, to please repeat the explanation of the crystallotype process. Yeah, it was a salted paper print from a glass negative that had been coated with albumin. Um, so before wet collodion, so in the late 1840s, um, there was uh, some uh, inventors had produced albumin on glass negatives. And it was the albumin that uh, contained the photochemicals rather than uh, collodion, as in wet collodion. So but it's an absolute nightmare. Sorry to cut uh, across you, Donna. Uh, it's, it's a nightmare because um, at this time, people were inventing processes that were just slight variants and calling it by a strange name. So you could have the Hamba type, you could have the G type, you could have the Moses type, you know, just, just shove type at the end of your name. <laughs> or, or, or Chris, you know, crystal type. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Um, yes, and when you were talking about the salted paper, the image being in the print instead of in the albumin layer on top yeah. of the paper. Um, it's tricky, but what I learned to do when I was cataloging, and with a lot of help from the Graphics Atlas website, uh, would be able to see that the image is sort of soaked into the paper. It's not sitting in like a, yeah. a, a layer on top. So although you can still see the fibers of the paper, with the albumin print, it's when it's when you're looking at the salted paper, it's really sort of in the paper. Yeah. So it's it. But it, but it, the, the only problem with that is that you do get uh, descriptions which are lightly albuminized salted paper. Print. Right. That's <laughs> that's another nightmare. Yeah, that's another nightmare. Exactly. Um, but basically, if it's matte and not shiny, and right. it looks as though it's in the paper, it's it's more than likely to be a a, uh, um, a salted paper print. Okay, uh, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Um, did photolithography use stone like lithography did? Uh, it did uh, in in some instances, um, but very quickly they they wanted to get off. The thing about um, uh, moving away from uh, lithographic stone is they're very big, very heavy, and very take up a lot of space. And so there was a big um, drive to try and find cheaper uh, surfaces and so they moved to metal plates and particularly zinc zinc plates um, but it's 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 it, that also comes through from uh, uh, standard lithography um, so that whole transition is an area I'm working on at the moment is that transition from uh, lithographic printers into photolithographic printers and so, you know, the, the, that's something that um, is a very important to understand that, you know, there was a continuum there and there were some very important people, including um, uh, people who were uh, a guy called Rudolf Appel, who worked at the Ordnance Survey and actually cracked photolithography into photozincography through his previous experiences as a printer. Um. Mike, did you have a question? I, I do, Dr. Hamburg. Um, I, I, I worked in, in publishing for many years, so this is all, this is mother's milk to me. The, um, I'm curious about the, uh, what I would call the just post-1880 era where photogravure, if you will, suddenly became I, what I think of as a, as a major um, image printing uh, um, experience. Do you feel that that's, a, you know, part of your, uh, part of your portfolio going forward or, or well, not? I, 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 um, I made a decision a long time ago, actually, when I was doing my PhD research, that I was going to stop at 1880. And the point I wanted to make was that Carl Klitsch, um, really you know that's the major milestone and that uh after that you're quite right you know that photomechanical printing 
uh, takes off big time. And uh, I, 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 I decided, therefore, I couldn't uh, go into that space because it became too big. And what I found out actually is that I'm going further and further back towards the beginning of the period I study. Okay. Uh, and that comparatively little work has been done on um, uh, the 1840s. And we're discovering things all the time now, if you, because basically because of so many resources being on the web. Right. And presumably lots of people experimenting, not knowing that other people were experimenting. Doing this, this yeah. Thing and in that era. and, and uh, I discovered recently in the early 1850s, uh, part of the um, US Coast Survey, um, the head of one guy there um, working on printing from daguerreotypes. And, wow. you know, I would recommend if people don't know it, the Clark Art Institute has this amazing collection um, uh, from uh, David Hansen. And um, that that's really worth going to because uh, it's all well illustrated and it includes his descriptions um, of it. So he's one of the, the greats of photomechanical processes. One last question. I, I've always had a fascination with um, Adolf Braun uh, having seen some of his early uh, um, panoramic photographs and that sort of thing, which were done on albumin, regular albumin prints. Was his carbon process any different from the other carbon processes for, uh, uh, for that in the 1870s? Uh, the answer is probably a bit. Um, th there were sort of tips and tricks that they they might use, but uh, in essence, it was the same process. And there's also a lot of what we call smoke and mirrors that they, they didn't want um, anybody to be able to copy mm. them directly. So the, the, the core process of, of, uh, of carbon printing was there, but there probably were little tweaks and modifications. Um, but, uh, uh, These new... <laughs> Marietta, please mute. Um, thank you. Those are those are questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, if other people are uh, uh, have more to request, go go post the chose, post the chat. Um, right? Can you mute people? Uh, I'm going to try to. Okay. Wow. Sorry, I gotta find it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, oh, oh. Oh, wow. Oh, I can't that? find you. I can't find you where you are. Can you just do mute all? Yeah, I can try. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not good at this. Yeah, this is really well done. It's a Thank you. Goodbye for now. Um, hey guys, uh, I'm, I'm just going to plow through here. Um, oh good. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's a few more questions. Uh, I can't see who this is from. Deborah? When you examine the collotypes and heliographs under magnification, how does the image matrix differ? Um, yeah, it's, it's got a different uh, granular structure. Um, I think, again, you need to, um, I, I haven't got um, examples here, um, but if you go onto the web, you can find examples of that. So there are physical, physical differences. But sometimes they're quite marginal and it's uh you know i've been studying this for a number of years but i i'm i the older i get the more i realize i know absolutely nothing um so yeah you do need to to, to learn by you know, getting a crib sheet almost um and having those samples um and, and the different granular structures there so there's different reticulation uh, depending on the process there, um, there is a website called Graphics Atlas uh, that the Image Permanence Institute from RIT has created with incredible microscopic magnifications of different processes, including collotypes, which look to me like little worms. Yeah, yeah. There's a sort of difference yeah. in, in, in the, the way the ink is on the paper. 
and I'll type that link into the chat. I recommend it's a great browsing tool. Um, I use it all the time. Um, uh, graphicsatlas.com, I believe. And uh, there's another question from Bill Rosenthal. Um, were autochromes reproduced and through what process? Um, they were. Um, this is sort of outside the scope of this particular talk, but autochromes, yeah, they were printed um, uh, onto, onto paper. Um, not particularly successfully, I think. The autochrome is a, is a very interesting process based on mathematic distribution of, uh, of granules. Um, but there are some stunning, stunning ones. But yes, they, they, they were they were copied and, and printed. I noticed that um, I love the pictures of the women uh, printing in Scotland. And it was it Gaudin? Uh, I was um, no, it was uh, um, George Washington Wilson. Wilson. Um, were there women who registered patents in any of these processes that you know about? Um, Probably not. Not that any spring to mind. I mean, the, the whole role of women photographers and uh, printing processes needs a lot more work. Um, but but I can't think of any. I think the other th thing is, and I've got to be careful about this: is could a woman actually register a patent? You mean by by law? By law. Okay. Yeah. So that, I, I would. I'm not. I don't know whether that's a yes or no, but. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the dist distribution of tasks, um, women played a much bigger role uh, than was thought. But I, I was particularly interested in the fact that Talbot employed boys, Adolf Brown, men and boys, and then suddenly there's this switch to women. Um, and uh, Ad uh, the Washington Wilson um, is a good example of that. And then, of course, when it gets to Kodak, it's fully industrialized. Uh, Nicole's commenting that uh, she believes they could, but they were not encouraged to seek the patents. I'm sure that's true. So uh, thanks, Nicole. Um, I had a question about the overpainting. Um, wouldn't that make the the actual print itself much more fragile? The, the, how did the overpaint sort of bond? Was there a lacquer that they put on top? How could they? No, they, that? They, they they painted directly on. Uh, some some of them they also painted onto daguerreotypes, um, and um, so so basically part of the uh, transition. So you saw that the, the very beginning um, the. Uh, um, the Morrissey uh, cartoon of what's going to happen to um, in, uh, engravers now that photography has arrived in 1839. So the other uh, profession that was uh, uh, damaged by it were miniature portrait painters. Mm -hmm. So many of them uh, became colorists in photographic studios. And uh, the examples I gave you uh, of the uh, painted Union soldier, um, and uh, uh, the other one of the, uh, um, the Native American, they're very, very crude, but there are some that are very, very high quality. Um, and I think, you know, you, you paid top dollar if you had a, a very, very good quality colorist. And it's the same, the same, the same the case with the daguerreotypes. Some of them, you know, bluntly, you look at them quickly, they look like color photographs. Or often just a detail, like the gold in a necklace, like a little gilt yeah, yeah. here and there, or the yeah, that's right. of the cheeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Nicole says, uh, regarding patents, uh, we might mention Anna Atkins. Yeah, you, you might mention Anna Atkins. I think, I mean, I've, I've um, recently uh, written an essay um, on um, uh, introduction of women photographers, and Anna Atkins is one of the case studies. She's significant, but what you've got to remember is that she had very little contemporary impact. Very little contemporary impact. I think this is, you know, one of the dilemmas of photographic history that there's been a canon of, of uh, the good and the great, uh, and that um, she is very important. I'm not taking away from that, okay. but but you know, if you 
if you were going around the scientific salons of uh, the world in the 1840s and mentioning Anna Atkins, um, it wouldn't ring many bells. She did the cyanotypes of the seaweed, is that? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's a beautiful book or two with reproductions yeah. of her work. Because um, it was a big exhibition at the uh, uh, New York Public Library in 2018. And uh, the catalog was, was uh, um, published by Hans Krauss. Let's see, a few more questions. Joel says, uh, was the reason there are fewer true human forms in the early prints because of the prolonged exposure times needed? Yeah, indeed. So that, that um, particularly with the daguerreotypes in the 1840s, um, there are, you know, that if you've got somebody to stand, you know, particularly with a uh, topographical view, very, very still for 30 seconds, then you could capture them. Um, but the example I gave of uh, um, the Italian um, aquatints of daguerreotypes, that's representative that, you know, they would shove in um, uh, figures. And, and to be quite frank, um, sometimes it looks a bit odd because over the years of looking at these reproductions of daguerreotypes, particularly of architectural buildings, what you find is that they they reproduce the shadowing very accurately. They transcribe shadows that normally uh, an artist wouldn't go into that detail. But then you look at the figures and the figures aren't, um, well, they aren't Michelangelo or Leonardo. I can tell you that they're pretty crude. And so you've got this photographic look of the, the topography of the building and then the rather odd dropped in figures. Yes, and... Uh... Oh, I noticed in the text just going by in the Tithana type yeah. article mentioned icing glass. Yeah. Was that, it was that what they used? Uh, I, the simple answer to that is I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I'll the honest answer. The, what I, I think the important thing is that there was a, um, a lot of smoke and mirrors, as I say, about the actual techniques. That were being used and the materials um, and one, one of the things that you learn quite early on when you start reading um, the, the contemporary literature particularly in the 1840s and early 1850s is that people will say I bought that manual on how to do a daguerreotype and it doesn't work and so um, some authors were, were uh, making money out of publishing not quite accurate uh, chemical formulae etc um, and so it was difficult to actually get the, the process to work of course there are other considerations like the quality of the water if it was polluted and, and whatever but uh, that was a, a theme let's see oh and i i was wrong it's graphicsatlas.org not dot com so i posted that into the chat right. apologies um let's see I don't see any other questions in chat. Does anyone, uh, how are we doing for time, Reich? Well, we're at uh, 3.15. So we've been at it an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. Um, I'll just say quickly, um, if anyone has any questions they would like to ask in person, uh, now would be the time to just do that quickly. If anyone has any direct questions. And uh, again, this has been such a pleasure, Anthony, that you could join us from the UK. I'm glad we were able to make it a, at a time that we could all get together. Here, 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 here. And um, I would like to uh, just thank everyone for attending. And um, I, I particularly loved all of the, the, the daguerreotype mini cartoon. That was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I mean, like, you've got to imagine in, 18, in in eighteen thirty nine. I mean, the caricature was 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 a uh, um, a, a, a humorous magazine, but um, you know, I reckon the people would have been spluttering into their coffees and teas, looking <laughs> at you know what was going to happen. You know, ap apocalypse in my my particular area as an engraver, or 
but also the disinformation. I, the point I wanted to make there was that they talked about daguerreotypes on paper. Okay. Well, you know, if you didn't know what a daguerreotype was, you go, yes, fine. If you did, you, you know about it, you'd say, what are you talking about? Uh, if yes. I may ask a question. Sure. Hi, Vlad. Hi, Dr. Hamber. Question is about this book. Yep. Can you see it? Yep. Yeah. It's uh, one of the copies that's the book that Talbot wrote and uh, he illustrated with his uh, with his photographs. Yep. I was amazed by the resolution. Um, you can see if you can. Yeah. Actually, you used some yep. photographs from this book in your presentation. And um, uh, how was that possible in uh, 1864 to get that kind of resolution? Well, the, the resolution in the emulsion was um, still very big, uh, very, very uh, large. Um, and you've got to understand that the uh, uh, the negatives, uh, when printed, were contact printed. So um, the, 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 all all the detail in the negative, uh, which was high, was translated directly as a one to one. So it, you know it wasn't lost by any form of enlargement. Um, okay. And you know one of the, the challenges in the digital age is that. Um, and this is sort of another part of my, my background in digital imaging. And that is that if you take a, a 10 by 8 glass plate negative, a black and white one, you're going to be scanning gigabytes worth of data out of a single plate. It's got that amount of resolving power. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, not surprising. Um, and I don't know if you can see in the background behind me is a daguerreotype by Baron Gros of the um, Great Exhibition. And the, the, the amount of detail in that, which is again about 10 by 8 uh, inches, is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, you probably can't see if I get out of the way, just down at the bottom there, that white thing is an equestrian statue uh, yeah. of Prince Albert and Prince of uh, Victoria is on the other side behind Hamber and Anthony Hamber. Anyway, the, the point of the story being is that um, those are two plaster casts that were destroyed and the leading Victorian uh, sculpture historian had never ever seen a photograph of them and was beside himself with happiness when I sent him an enlargement because he said not only can I see it first time as a photograph but I understand now the mechanism that kept it standing up I can see the tripod underneath it. So the phenomenal amounts of information in the daguerreotype, uh, not quite as much in a photographic print by, by Talbot, but still enormous amounts. Looks like we have one more question from Nicole. Nicole, do you want to ask directly? Oh, hi, thanks. Um, so fascinating. Um, you, Dr. Amber, you talked uh, about some anxiety and worry very early on um, in the engraving professional community. But is it not the case that engraving of some type or another remained the, the predominant form of periodical illustrations into, say, the 19, maybe night, early 1920s? Um, I, the answer is yes. I mean, photography was still right up. I mean, it's the end of the period that I'm involved in. Uh, or research in, um, uh, uh, not, I wouldn't say niche, it's more than a niche market, but you know, you, you look at um, illustrated publications and most of them are still engraved um, so, and, or lithographed. So it continued to be like that. Um, there, there are some strange anomalies. So um, there's a, a book by Margaret Winnie, which is a architectural history book. Um, they, that used line drawings right up until the 1970s uh, in different editions. So there is a tradition there, um, but you can see milestones like when uh, um, photo photographic illustration starts appearing in newspapers in the first century, sorry, first decade of the 20th century, etc. 
So um, yeah, um, but but that's that's almost for somebody else to go and go and look at. Uh, I, I, so you know, by eighteen eighty, um, uh, things were really beginning to, to, to take off, and there were photographic illustrated periodicals, serials, books, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, that period um, up uh, from nineteen hundred really onwards. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm building. Uh, I have been building for several decades now a uh, annotated bibliography, a database of photographic illustrated publications, and uh, I've currently got twelve thousand published before eighteen eighty. But if you consider how many publications were, you know, it's about two percent of all publications. Mm. So that's the finding at the moment. Um, and then it, then it changes very significantly after that in terms of a percentage. Thank you. All right. Um, if you don't mind, I have another question. Sure. Uh, Dr. Hamber, uh, you mentioned Daguerre, of course. Uh, and um, there are so many, so much controversial information about him. Um, is that possible for me to uh, contact you personally, to email you? Maybe you, you have some more information about Daguerre? Yeah, sure. If, uh, if Donna can, uh, can send that through. Let me... Um, actually, if you would just type your email into the chat, that might be the fastest way, because I don't think we had that document pasted in. That would be great. If you don't I can't know. promise I'm going to answer <laughs> straight away, okay? Uh, but I will endeavor to do so. Um, Thank you very much. Do you have a title for the book that you're working on with uh, Stephen Joseph? Uh, well, its provisional title is Before the Half Tone. Great. When is that expected to? Do you have a, a date yet? We don't have a date yet. I mean, we've yeah. got a lot of. Uh, we've got chapter structures and quite a lot of the text there but um you know we're discovering new things um all the time i mean the, the main hope is to get the uh the database um into at, at a point where it can be published and made free, freely available oh, great yes we will um keep our eyes open for that and um the other thing i wanted to mention is that um we hope that you will join us for future presentations. I know most of them are late in the evening compared yep. to your schedule, but they will be on YouTube as well. So we okay, that's we're, great. We're so thankful that you're now a part of FISNI, and um, I want to just thank you again. And everyone, continue round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. And um, this, um, Reich, are, are we rounding out the presentation? Yep, we're, I, think we're, I think we're all set. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us. We had 43 at the, at the peak. <laughs> that was, that's not bad. Um, and again, thank you, uh, Dr. Hamper, from coming all the way across the Atlantic to no talk to us today. <laughs> I'm off for my supper now. <laughs> Thank you well, so and much. that's that's a good thing. Okay. Um, at this point, we're going to shut ourselves down here. Thank you again, Joel. Okay. Any Take last care. words? Thank you, Dr. Hamper. Okay. Uh, I think we're good. Thank you very much. And um, this was definitely enjoyable and informative. Um, all of us appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, keep your eyes open for an email on how to sign up for the holiday party if you would like to share something from your collection. I'm the guy who sends it, so make sure you make sure you read it. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.